Welcome to Go Within Meditation, the channel where we explore the depths of our consciousness and uncover the magic within ourselves. Today, we dive into the first chapter of the transformative book, The Magic in Your Mind by U.S. Anderson. In this chapter, titled The Hidden Cause of All Things, we will delve into the power of our consciousness to shape our reality and become the masters of our own lives. So sit back, relax, and let the words of this chapter guide you towards a greater understanding of the magic within you. Chapter 1 The Hidden Cause of All Things Shakespeare's Hamlet in his famed soliloquy pondered, to be or not to be, and thus faced squarely the primary challenge of life. Most people only exist, never truly are at all. They exist as predictable equations, reacting rather than acting, walking compendiums of aphorisms and taboos, reflexes and syndromes. Surely the gods must chuckle at the ironic spectacle of robots fancying themselves free, but still, when finally the embodied consciousness rises above the pain-pleasure principle of nature, then the true meaning of freedom is made apparent at last. Action versus Reaction We exist in order that we may become something more than we are not through favorable circumstance or auspicious occurrence, but through an inner search for increased awareness. To be, to become, these are the commandments of evolving life, which is going somewhere, aspires to some unsealed heights, and the awakened soul answers the call, seeks, grows, expands. To do less is to sink into the reactive prison of the ego, with all its pain, suffering, limitation, decay, and death. The man who lives through reaction to the world about him is the victim of every change in his environment, now happy, now sad, now victorious, now defeated, affected but never affecting. He may live many years in this manner, wrapped with sensory perception and the ups and downs of his surface self, but one day pain so outweighs pleasure that he suddenly perceives his ego is illusory, a product of outside circumstances only. Then he either sinks into complete animal lethargy or, turning away from the senses, seeks inner awareness and self-mastery. Then he is on the road to really living, truly becoming, then he begins to uncover his real potential, then he discovers the miracle of his own consciousness, the magic in his mind. Mastery over life is not attained by dominion over material things, but by mental perception of their true cause and nature. The wise man does not attempt to bend the world to fit his way or to coerce events into a replica of his desires, but instead strives for a higher consciousness that enables him to perceive the secret cause behind all things. Thus he finds a prominent place in events, by his utter harmony with them he actually appears to be molding them. He moves effortlessly through the most strenuous action, the most perilous times because his attunement with the mental force that controls the universe guides him to perform the work that needs to be done. Electromagnetic Mind This mental force that controls the universe may be called anything you like and visualized any way you choose. The important thing is to understand that it exists, to know something about how it works, what your relationship to it is. It might, for instance, be likened to an enormous electromagnetic field. All conscious forms of life then would be tiny electromagnetic fields within the universal field and finding positions within it, each according to the kind and quality of its field. Where each individual field would wind up within the main field then would be a matter of inexorable law and absolutely unavoidable, as is illustrated by the millions of people who perform the same tasks over and over with absolutely the same results, almost as if following ritual. Perhaps they are always sick, always defeated, just barely misers, perhaps always broke, always out of a job. If we give just the slightest reflection to our own lives, we cannot help but be startled by how we seem dogged by the same situation in all things, year after year, time after time. This deadly recurrence is the source of most frustration and mental illness, is the bottom root of all failure. Yet it is avoidable. And the way by which it is avoidable brings complete emancipation of the mind and spirit. For the tiny electromagnetic field has inherent within it the ability to change the kind and quality of its field, 
so that it will be moved about within the main field with all the power and sureness of the main field until it arrives at the position its new quality of consciousness demands. The important thing to remember about this illustration is that the tiny electromagnetic field does not move itself. It is moved by the large field. And behind its movement lies all the power of the large field. Any attempt by it to move itself is obviously futile since it is held in place by a power infinitely greater than itself. And it is held where it is because of what it is. The moment a change occurs within itself, it is moved by a power outside itself to a new position in the field, one in keeping with its new potential. The mental world. The foregoing is admittedly an analogy, but nevertheless S.W. Trump in his remarkable book, Psychical Physics, has proved beyond all doubt that the human being exudes certain electromagnetic fields, that the earth itself gives off an electromagnetic field, and his illustrations are so impeccably documented that there cannot possibly be any scientific quarrel with them. We indeed may be on the very threshold of scientific proof of those invisible areas of human aspiration that have hitherto been the province of philosophers, diviners, and priests. Departments of investigation into the paranormal abilities of the human psyche have been established at our leading universities, and it is now surely only a matter of time until we are faced with the final irrevocable proof of our intuitive perception, the power of mind over matter. It is a mental world we live in, not a physical one at all. The physical is merely an extension of the mental, and an imperfect extension at that. Everything we see, hear, and feel is not a hard and inescapable fact at all, but only the imperfect revelation to the senses of an idea held in mind. Preoccupation with sensory experience has focused attention on effects instead of causes, has led scientific investigation down a blind alley where everything grows smaller into infinity or larger into infinity and walls man off from the secrets that lie behind life. It is not the planets and stars, the elements and winds, or even the existence of life itself that is the miracle that demands our attention. It is consciousness. It is the mere fact of being, the ability to say, I. Consciousness is an indisputable fact the greatest miracle of all, and all the sights and sounds of the world are merely side effects. The Hidden Eye To be conscious is to be conscious, there are not different kinds. The eye that is in your neighbor is the exact same eye within you. It may appear to be different through being attached to different sensory experience, but that is only because it has allowed itself to be conditioned by such experience. In point of actual fact consciousness is never the result of experience but the cause instead, and wherever we find it, it is primarily aware of existing, of being I. There is only one basic consciousness in all creation, it takes up its residence in all things, appears to be different according to the things it enters into, but in essence is never changed at all. It is intelligence, awareness, energy, power, creativeness, the stuff from which all things are made. It is the Alpha and Omega of existence, first cause, it is you. Everything in nature contains all the powers of nature. Everything is made of one hidden stuff, wrote Ralph Waldo Emerson. He pierced the veil, perceived behind the sense and alluring dance of nature's myriad forms the workings of the one mind and one intelligence from which all life and aspiration spring. There can be no inner peace or surety of action without this basic spiritual knowledge. The man who lives isolated from the roots of his being has cut himself off from the source of all power and dwells alone and without resource in a hostile and threatening world. Let him once perceive the true nature of life and his relationship to it and he soon sees that the world always reflects his thoughts. The Mask The surface mind or sense-self or ego is the villain of the play that is being enacted on the human stage at present. Man as a form of life is sufficiently evolved so as to understand his separateness and uniqueness. He looks in the mirror and understands that the reflected animal is he. He is concerned with the appearance and welfare of this animal and ponders its relationships with the world and others. He does not truly understand what he is, only that he is conscious and confined within a particular body, and the experience and knowledge he acquires 
together with his disposition as to their use, he labels I, and thus he is deluded into calling a ghost by his own name. Hidden behind this ghost, obscured by its struggles and fancies, is the secret self, which even though hidden, ignored, or misunderstood, nevertheless moves all things on the chessboard of life according to their natures and aspirations. We are never ego or sense self. These are masks we don as we play at the parts we find in life. What we truly are is not a changing thing, but is whole and entire, powerful and serene, limitless and eternal. It springs from the inexhaustible source of life itself, and when we learn to identify ourselves with it, then we have hitched a ride on a power so far beyond our tiny temporal selves that our lives are changed in the most amazing manner. The Imprisoned Self To be what we are and to become what we are capable of being, wrote Robert Louis Stevenson, is the only end of life. But when we stultify our divine birthright in manacles of mental and spiritual limitations, then we have no alternative but stagnation and pain. As long as we are responsive solely to the stimuli that impinge upon our senses from the outer world, we have no choice but to be victims of every circumstance. Locked to the senses, we reel under each stimulus, now aggressive, now afraid, now joyful, now sad, now seeking death, now life, but always our inner serenity and equilibrium are in the hands of something we neither understand nor control and so we are puppets, pulled by invisible and unknown strings, swirling in the maelstrom of life like scraps of paper in the wind, and if perchance we garner knowledge enough to perceive our helplessness, then we often are overcome with such depths of sadness as to make effort against our bonds an almost unimaginable thing. But the moment that we pause long enough in the headlong rush of life to see that we are not moving in accord with or in response to our own decisions but rather in reaction to the world around us, then we have taken the first step toward freedom. Only one who knows his slavery can aspire to be free, just as true freedom is possible only to one who has experienced chains. Our hates, loves, fears, envies, aspirations, deceits are for the most part products of circumstance, of false and limiting codes and mores, more often innate terrors of mountains that are molehills, and the solution to all of them is to stand foursquare before them, daring them to do their utmost, exposing them for what they are, thus forswearing allegiance to the cupidity of the deluding and blinding ego which forever keeps us thinking we are greater than others and less than we truly are. The liberating power. It is not necessary to become a mystic, even a philosopher, certainly not a melancholy metaphysician, in order to come to grips with the spiritual side of existence, to establish a mental causation in your life that will give you control of circumstance. What is necessary, however, is that you do not immediately throw out the door everything that has to do with spirit simply because it is the established province of religion. You may be a Christian or a Hindu a Muslim or a Buddhist, a Taoist or Shintoist, but that only increases your individual human responsibility to think through all issues that bear on the world and life and death and your individual being. Only when you come to grips with your own mental essence, only when you arrive at a realization of the ephemeral, ever-changing nature of I will it become apparent that everything is in a constant state of growth and development and aspiration, and there are no limits and finalities and defeats, and anything is possible to one who first conceives the image in his mind. There is within us a power of complete liberation, descended there from whatever mind or intelligence lies behind creation, and through it we are capable of becoming anything and doing anything we can visualize. The mental stuff of which we are made is of such kind and quality that it responds to the formation of images within it by the creation of a counterpart that is discernible to the senses. Thus any picture we hold in our minds is bound to resolve in the material world. We cannot help ourselves in this. As long as we live and think, we will hold images in our minds, and these images develop into the things of our lives, and so long as we think a certain way we must live a certain way, and no amount of willing or wishing will change it, only the vision we carry within. And that concludes our reading of a portion of Chapter 1 from U.S. Anderson's The Magic in the Mind. We hope you found these insights illuminating and thought-provoking. Remember, to awaken the power of your mind and create the life you desire, you must recognize the hidden cause behind all things. 
Join us in the upcoming episodes as we delve deeper into the wisdom of this book and uncover more life-changing secrets. Thanks for tuning in and until next time, keep expanding your mind and unlocking your true potential.